what it is, yo. Welcome back to another top five edition here at MacGuffinPodcast.com. I'm Alan. And I'm Ed. And today on the top five, we shall be discussing our top five films that improved uh, with a second, third, multiple viewings. Movies don't change, but opinions do. And these five films talk about the ones that we enjoyed more. We got it wrong the first time. We got it better, more right the second time. There we go. Uh, okay, so I'll start off with my number five. Uh, my number five film is from 1990, directed by Mr. Paul Verhoeven, and it is Total Recall. And <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I chose this is... Well, when I first watched this movie, it was all about the action. It was all about Arnold Schwarzenegger kicking ass, ripping special arms off. effects, ripping off arms, uh, Quato coming out of the dude's stomach and everything like that. Three boobs. <laughs> I was going to say that, yeah. Oh, okay. Three boobs. Uh, but when I watched it again, I noticed like the little intricacies, um, the little details that were put in. Um, everything that happens in the second half of the movie is either hinted at or is talked about in the first half. And that's kind of the beauty of the film. We don't know whether or not um, Quaid, what he's going through, is because of what is actually happening at Recall or if it's truly happening in real life, if it's a dream or not. And just being able to pick out the little pieces here and there, um, there's that moment where Quaid's on the train and he looks up at the screen and what that thing that happens on the screen actually happens in the movie. Um, it just, for me... I was rewarded by watching that movie over and over again. And not to mention, that movie's just fun. It's just a fun movie. It know? is. So. Quato. <laughs> Open your <laughs> I haven't seen it in a while, though. I, you know, you make me want to see it again. There you cool. go. Well, my number five is, especially with the recent release of Skyfall, you know, James Bond's on everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. And the movie that I remember initially thinking, eh, but then I, I like it more now is The Spy Who Loved Me, actually. Okay. Um, Spy Who Loved Me. Uh, <laughs> uh, like, in my mind, uh, For Your Eyes Only is my favorite Roger Moore Bond film. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's a lot of reasons for that. But The Spy Who Loved Me, I always remember, I hadn't seen it in a while, and I was like, oh yeah, that's the one with the British flag on the parachute, which is a cool <laughs> stunt. But other than that, you know, eh, whatever. But this movie gave us Jaws, man. Mm -hmm. Jaws is cool. Yeah. He's, it, even you know he's a born again Christian now, but <laughs> but he was you know he's got big back then. big teeth. Yeah. Um, uh, the uh, the trip the Agent Triple X super hot. <laughs> um, it, it, it's a lot more fun. I mean, you know, I'll still say Free Your Eyes Only is my number one, Roger Moore, but Spy Love Me is definitely number two. Mm -hmm. It's no Moonraker stinky. This is some good stuff. <laughs> All right. Okay. I mean, I think this this is what's good about um, this list is because I actually haven't seen Spy Who Loved Me in a long, long time, and I barely remember it. So, I mean, it would be good to Jaws, you know, watch it. Jaws, Agent Triple X, British Flag. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> Off to a good start. Uh, moving on to my number four. Uh, my number four film is from 1967. Uh, it's Jean-Pierre Melville's Le Samurai. Um, first time I saw this movie, I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. I mean, you have the main character, uh, Costello, played by Elaine Delon, who's kind of like a really quiet dude, doesn't like really act out or get too emotional or anything like that and for me I was kind of like what's going on this movie kind of runs a little bit slow um, and then when I watched it again and then watched it for a third time I realized oh he's supposed to be like that I mean he's living the life pretty much by the code of the samurai he his entire existence is to be perfect at what he does and I found that to be incredibly incredibly awesome and um, for me this actually turned out to be my favorite Melville film um, it's all about a guy who you know lives by a code and that's if you like movies like Drive right it's the same thing you have a character there that lives by a code does things a certain way and doesn't like to you know uh, how do you say, change it or de deviate from it. There we go. And if you like that kind of movie, Le Samurai is that is the same kind of movie, and to me it's even better. So I'm sorry to sorry to admit this is on my two-watch list. I know it's definitely one of those great ones that I haven't seen. It's a classic. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sounds good. <laughs> well, uh, my number four is actually probably going to be Heresy that I ever didn't like it, but uh, the original Halloween... Really? Yeah, it took me... It, I had to warm to it. Um, oh, wow. I mean, you know, 
I probably I don't remember the first time I saw it. It was probably as a kid, and I probably just got scared and hid and whatever, <laughs> right? But for a long time, I always lumped it to get like for instance, I, I dig the Friday the Thirteenth movies a lot, even mm-hmm. though they're all pretty terrible. I mean, okay. you know, they're all pretty much the same. But Halloween's got a lot more art to it. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot more subtlety. Yeah, there's a, uh, you know, it's John Carpenter's classic about Michael Myers killing babysitters. And, uh, <laughs> um, but a, a lot of it is a, a, about framing, framing the scene. I mean, the, the scariest part is simply what's not in the frame, and then they turn away and they turn back, and suddenly Mike, Mike Myers is there. And, it, and I had to get older to realize, oh, that, that's artful. Like, that takes work. Mm-hmm. You know, this is kind of Hitchcockian. This is kind of, oh, I get it now, duh. So that was that was my bad, you know. Mm-hmm. So, I you know, it's still I still think Mike Myers like, in the sequels should be able to die at some point. But <laughs> you know, he's not supernatural. He's just a, a crazy kid. But that original movie is is rock solid. Interesting that you would miss out on this one, but I'm glad that you finally came around to it. Um, yeah. It's a classic. So, okay, moving on to my number three. Um, my number three. <laughs> film that improved improved with a third and fourth viewing <laughs> it's from 2008 written and directed by mr charlie kaufman and it is synecdoche new york first time i watched this i was pretty much like what the fuck is going on here you know you got this guy this uh, playwright played by philip seymour hoffman who gets this grant to make any kind of play or production that he wants and all of a sudden things just get crazy i mean he builds a dome with a city with a dome with a city with a dome and it just keeps on going forever and I'm the first time I saw it I was just like what the hell is going on here um, but after I watched it again and dug a little deeper I started realizing just like many of Kaufman's other work it's all about the process of creation and having that process kind of let loose and become out of control but with the character um, I mean that that movie's all about this guy who wants to make something unlike anything made before but totally loses it and gets caught up within his own ego and his own how do you say it um, epic wants is that one way to say it um, and the more I watched it more thought about it I find it to be really really great so. I, it's another one on my to watch list. I know a lot of critics like put it as one of their favorite of that year. You should put it on your one to watch again and again, <laughs> just to make sure. You I, I love Charlie Kaufman a lot, yeah. so it's definitely on the, on the list. Cool. Well, uh, my number three is going to be another another bit of heresy because um, it's much beloved, and that was Anchorman. Mm. And mm-hmm. the reason being, I saw the first one. I, I saw it in the the theater when it mm-hmm. came out, and I and I'm. I think it was one of those cases where everybody on the planet was like, oh my god, it's the funniest movie ever. And you know when literally a hundred people tell you something's funny, that it, it's really hard to laugh? Yeah, you it's don't, a little you, overhyped. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I remember going, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever, you stay classy, Sandy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, so I had to get away from it for a while, but you know revisiting it not too long ago I was like oh yeah oh, okay now I'm totally the sequels coming up mm-hmm. I'm excited about I'm excited that too yeah yeah um yeah you know Steve Carell's hilarious Paul Rudd's really funny I uh, you know and it it is Will Ferrell doing some of his best stuff so uh, again I think that was the case of too many people saying Dude, you gotta find this funny. This, know, is so, right? this is so funny. Uh. Yeah. I think uh, Paul Rudd's character put it best 60% of the time it works every time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move on to my number two. Uh, my number two, I gotta give a shout out to Brandy on this one because we both watched it around the same time and we were both kind of meh about it. But I watched it again and I liked it a lot more. And it's uh, Abbas Kiriostami's certified copy from 2010. The movie about two people, played by uh, Juliet Binoche and William Schmel, a writer and his fan, they meet, um, and pretty much the entire movie is just them having this conversation. Interesting thing that happens, though, is that in the beginning, you think it's they're meeting for the first time, but somewhere around the middle of the film, they start having conversations and acting as if they've been together for years. And when I first watched it, I was like, okay, that's kind of interesting, you know? But I watched it again, and it really started to have an effect on me. Um, 
not figuring out, you know, no. are they together, are they not. No spoilers. I'll try not to spoil it. Um, but that movie is all about telling us or examining why things affect us, right? Film and stories are fake for the most part. They're fiction, right? But yet they affect us in a certain way. And that mo this movie talks about that and puts that in an examination. I mean, if it's something that's fake and not real, then does it have the same effect as some as art that is real, that is coming from an original place? And the more I watch it, the more I think about that theme, and the more that film really, you know, touches me. Now I think it's a great freaking movie. I, it's it, your your whole list is turning into my <laughs> it's my net that's literally on my next Netflix queue. Just haven't gotten to it yet. There you go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a great one. I can't wait. Um, so my number two, and this is going to be I blame myself for just being young at some point was stop making sense. And it's really just because when I was a kid, I thought talking heads was kind of stupid. Hmm. And then I grew up and realized, oh, no, you're stupid, dude. Because <laughs> <laughs> David Byrne's great, the talking heads are great, and that's one of the greatest concert movies I've ever made. Huh. Um, have you seen this nah, one? I missed this Oh, one. it's super true. It's, it's, it's just a concert. It's just uh -huh. one concert. Jonathan Demme directed it er, okay. early on, and it's basically just their stage show. And it starts out with David Byrne, a tape recorder, and his white and and just standing there. He starts out singing Psycho Killer, and throughout the show, they build up more of the band comes on, like another song comes out, and two more people come oh, out. And by the end, like the last half hour is the entire band, which then they had like a, a, quite a few people backing them too, mm -hmm. but. They they have the stage filled and it and, and it kind of tells a story as the stage show goes on. Interesting. It's it was, and the music's great. I mean, it's you know kind of a greatest hits for them, um, but this one I totally blame on myself. Like I said, I remember even as a little kid thinking, "Talking Heads was a stupid name for a band." <laughs> no, it's, I'm an idiot. Interesting. So. Cool. Okay, so let's move on to my uh, number one. Uh, my number one is considered a classic film from 1957 and it is Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal. I kind of have... I don't love Ingmar Bergman, I admire him, <laughs> right? Some some of his films are it's pretty not, heavy. It's not light watching. Yes, his way. films are, are pretty heavy and when I saw The Seventh Seal I thought to myself, okay, I understand why this thing has made such an impact. Um, I mean, I saw Bill and Ted, <laughs> Bogus Adventure and everything like that with death and everything, and I, and I thought, okay, I, I get it. Um, but this movie, I think, is more of a historical kind of film to think about. I watched it again not too long ago, and I found myself really enjoying this movie and understanding why it's so great. First off, it's not... Okay, yes, it has very heavy themes about death and the existence of God and everything like that. But at the same time, it's actually pretty entertaining and it has some pretty funny moments in it, especially with that traveling uh, troop in it and yep. everything. And the performance by Max von Sydow is great. Um, so many classic scenes. Um, I think it's just one of those films, kind of like you, where I grew up. You know, yeah. I, I got mature, and my taste in film uh, matured <laughs> with age. And it, well, not to mention with that particular movie, that movie is so dense, so layered with symbolism that mm -hmm. you, you do have to. You, you can't get it all in the first try. Right. You, I, I I totally get you there. Yeah, I, yeah. It, it takes several watchings to truly mind that's that movie. kind of how Ingmar Bergman is yes. in general you know yeah it's not one of those things that you can just watch you know at, at any time you have to be in the mood to see Ingmar totally Bergman, so totally well that's good one my number one I, this is probably my most embarrassing on this whole list that I didn't like it or, or well I don't didn't like it the first time when it literally singing in the rain yeah, no, 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 here's, no, let me, let me, let me explain. Okay. So I, um, yeah, uh, she's my wife now, so I was smart enough to marry her. <laughs> but when we were dating, um, uh, she, you know, she was like, you've never seen Singing Rain, I'm going to show it to you. And I'm, you know, and so I was a hostile audience. You know, <laughs> has anybody ever forced you to watch something you're not in the mood for? And you're like, yeah. Uh -huh. And then I'm like, look at them. They're singing Good Morning, Good Morning, and they're, they're, they work in Hollywood, and they're eating sandwiches and drinking milk at midnight. <laughs> Nobody's that corny give me a break you know and I, I was having none of it okay. thought it was you know I'm again 
me. This was all on me. It's a great movie. I'm an idiot. Donald O'Connor is wonderful. Make him laugh is one of the best musical numbers ever. Yeah. Singing in the Rain's great. Gene Kelly's awesome. Please keep your hate letters to yourself. I was being a jerk. But this movie is terrific. And yeah, no, it's just my, my, the first time I saw it, I was just in one of those, I'm going to be contrary moods. Okay. I'll, I'll give you a, a tiny bit of credit on this one. It's not my favorite musical. I but think, it's up there. But it's freaking great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you must have been in some sort of mood when you first I, I, watched that movie. I was, I was being a jerk. <laughs> yeah. So, but again, glad you came around to it. So, all right. That does it for our top five movies that improved with a second viewing. There's a lot out there. And if there's any that you would like to share, share, please let it be known at mcguffinpodcast.com. And we will see you guys next time.